In this lecture, we're going to focus on the patient in the interactions with the healthcare system and look at both patient and provider interactions and communication, as well as issues related to adherence to medical advice and medical regimens. We know that uh, effective communication between the patient and the provider is incredibly important to the maximum efficacy of healthcare. We know effective communication is associated with higher satisfaction for both the provider and the patient, better adherence to treatment plans, which leads to better outcomes, more appropriate medical decisions, um, and, and better health outcomes overall. And one of the things that's particularly of interest to providers is a decreased likelihood of malpractice suits. One of the best things any healthcare provider can do to reduce the chance of malpractice is maintain effective, um, good relationships with their patients using good communication. Now, one thing about the provider and patient relationship is it has some interesting features. Uh, first is there's an inherent power differential in the relationship. The physician has the knowledge, the expertise, the power in many instances, and the patient is uh, relatively a powerless lacking information uh, in the relationship. Uh, patients often invest lots of powerful expectancies. They expect a lot of physicians. To some extent, we almost um, expect our physicians to do magical things. Now, that can be important because that's an important aspect of placebo effects, and we know positive expectancies are an important part of uh, maximizing health outcomes from any kind of health intervention. So physicians really need to try to leverage the expectancies. They need to try to not do anything that really discourages the strong positive expectancies patients have. Therefore, the ideal uh, provider in a relationship demonstrates self-confidence and authority. You don't really want a doctor who's wishy-washy, who's uncertain, um, who demonstrates self-doubt. Um, that can undermine your confidence in that physician and that can undermine um, health outcomes. One of the things to also keep in mind is this relationship often occurs in an emotion-laden context. Uh, patients, when they're interacting with providers, are often fearful, they're anxious, they may be confused, and because of those strong, powerful emotions, it can be a real barrier to effective communication. Conversations that could normally be easily comprehended and recalled um, under normal circumstances, patients often really struggle with basic comprehension and recall in medical interactions. And part of what's a challenge with um, patient-provider communication is to some extent they speak a different language. Uh, patients communicate in what we call the language of illness. They have subjective complaints. You know, it hurts over here when I lay on my side, this happens. Well, this has been going on for a few days. Um, it feels like this. Um, they use metaphors and whatnot. They interpret those complaints in their own way with their own experience and understanding. And patients generally take more of a storytelling approach to trying to explain what's going on with me, what's the concern. Physicians actually use a different way to communicate, a different way to organize information about health symptoms. They prefer to communicate in what we call the language of disease. They look for a sequential and coherent, cohesive sets of symptoms that go together with physical findings that point to a definitive diagnosis, that point to an answer of what's going on that should then translate into a plan for treatment. This language of disease really requires a translation from the language of illness for patients. So uh, you might think of your own interactions with physicians and how they are asking questions to really understand and to translate, maybe in speaking back to you about what they understand, they're using different words. Well, they're translating your, your, um, your, your language of illness. Um, so maybe you're saying something like, you know, I feel like I can't breathe, and they'll say you have shortness of breath. That's translating the language of your symptoms to the language of disease. There are at least a couple of ways to kind of categorize provider-patient interactions. One is what we call doctor-centered interactions. These are characterized by relatively little listening, a lot of control over the conversation, and the emphasis is really on the expertise and authority of the physician. The important part of the conversation is what the physician has to say. This is ideal in situations like trauma or serious acute situations where you want a doctor who takes charge, who is authoritarian, who's directive, who's decisive. 
There can also be patient-centered interactions. These are characterized much more by careful listening, using things like open-ended questions and reflections, more of a shared control or even a patient having control over the direction of the conversation, and the emphasis is on collaboration or using a more collaborative style. This is an ideal type of interaction for other kinds of interactions with providers. For example, in talking about chronic conditions or talking about changing behavioral habits, patient-centered interactions tend to be much more effective. So um, an ideal physician needs to really be skilled and competent at having both kinds of interactions and using the right kind of interaction to fit the right situation and the right um, target for that intervention. We also know that settings for the interactions make a difference. Uh, many of these will be familiar to you if you visited the doctor. Ideally, we want situations where there's privacy, where there's quiet, where there's a close proximity. You see like in the picture here where the physician's fairly close to the patient. You want ideally to have an absence of physical barriers. You know, some of us have had that experience of having a doctor talk to us while tapping on a keyboard or having a clipboard or something, and those can really get in the way and be distracting to good interactions. One of the things that unfortunately is not often present in our healthcare system is we'd ideally like to have no rushing. We don't want to have that time pressure of I, we got to cut to the chase and get this conversation over with. Unfortunately, in our healthcare system, there's frequently a sense of time pressure and, and patients may perceive that the provider is rushing uh, in these conversations. One of the uh, things we may uh, know something about is the structure of a typical medical encounter. Um, and pay attention to this next time you visit a physician for a common primary care complaint. You might notice that they follow a typical pattern. Um, a common model is what's called the SEGUE model, S-E-G-U-E, -E, which is an acronym for a, a pattern of conversation that begins with setting the stage. So the doctor may introduce themselves, may explain what they already know, and then may ask a question. They progress on to eliciting information. What's the problem? How long has it been going on? Could you please describe it? They may then give some information. Giving information refers to um, the doctor's understanding or explanation of what they think may be going on. They then recommend that they understand the patient's perspective. So asking the, the patient to sort of repeat what it is that they understand the physician to communicate, to have communicated, um, can be very helpful in making sure they get it, get it correctly. And lastly, end the encounter, and this is where the physician may, uh, you know, direct you where to go to pay the bill, give some final instructions for medications, um, uh, may arrange for a follow-up visit, and uh, say goodbye. So next time you're in the doctor's office, watch and see if you see this general kind of segue model be um, at play in your interaction with the physician. Uh, you may just think that it's common conversation, but chances are that your physician is following a particular set of competency in, in this model. Also, I want to mention in today's lecture just a little bit about the importance of treatment adherence. We know that a bunch of medical advice is not followed or not followed completely, maybe as much as half, estimated 40%. Uh, and this is a big problem. Uh, for one, it results in less than optimal treatment and outcomes. And so if, if the doctor advises you take a course of medicine and you take half of it, you're not going to get the optimal outcomes. It can also be a public health problem, so not only a problem for individual patients, but for public health. You may see in the news the concerns about development of antibiotic-resistant bacteria and what a challenge those are going to be in the coming years and decades. And partly that's a result of people not following advice to take their antibiotics the full course of treatment. So taking every pill in the bottle when you get a prescription is super important for antibiotics. If you don't do that, you just take them until symptoms are better, you may succeed in, in uh, keeping the bacteria at bay enough to clear yourself of symptoms, but enough bacteria may survive that adapts to that antibiotic um, and becomes a more resistant um, illness over time. Uh, we know that treatment non-adherence is uh, often blamed on the patient, but there's a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, certainly, patient factors are part of it. So whether the patient understands the need for adherence and all of the necessary parameters are, of adherence, uh, whether there may be some mental health issues in the way or perhaps health beliefs. You know, people vary, for example, in their, their desire and their trust in pills and medications. And if somebody, you know, is really anti-pills, they may not um, comply as much with a 
uh, medication uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, the presence of supports in the patient's life, that people around who care about them, who watch for them, who help them remind. And there can be sociocultural barriers, so just cultural beliefs about uh, treatment approaches and, and the necessity of following um, uh, patient advice. Um, these, by the way, can work in the favor of adherence because there certainly are some cultures that are uh, more trusting of physicians, more respectful of physicians, and will follow their advice completely, whereas others may less so. So, but besides patient factors, there's other characteristics. There can be characteristics of the disease, how severe or life-threatening is the disease, what are the salience of symptoms or the salience of improvements in symptoms. If patients don't really see that the illness is progressing or is getting in the way of their life, they may not take the treatment as seriously. If they don't see improvements in a very short period of time, they may not continue those. Uh, taking antidepressant medication is a good example of this. We know that antidepressant medications work for folks, but in the average person, it takes about two weeks until they start feeling a clinical effect. Well, many patients that with the antidepressants will take them for a week, complain they're not feeling better, but they may be feeling some side effects, and so they'll quit taking the medication. They haven't taken it long enough to experience the benefits. There can also be treatment factors. Many, many treatments have side effects that are intolerable and discourage people from adhering to those treatments. Some treatments re require a huge degree of behavior change. They require people to totally change their lifestyle or become a, a much different impacts in their lifestyle, and that, of course, would be a big factor. Some treatment regimens are very complex. Uh, many medical medicine regimens for people living with HIV are very complicated. There's many different drugs to be taken at many different times during the day, some once a day, some several times a day, some refrigerated, some not refrigerated, some with food, some without food, and it can be very complicated to keep up with that kind of regimen day after day. And lastly, there can be interpersonal factors. To what degree does the patient and the physician have a good relationship? To what extent is there a strong sense of trust um, and confidence? Uh, there's even some evidence that uh, tactile contact, the physicians um, touching the patient in a, in a uh, gentle way, a touch on the arm or a handshake or perhaps even a hug or an arm around the shoulders, can make a difference in patients' ultimate follow-up um, uh, based on the care they experienced from that particular physician. We know that there are some ways to improve adherence. There are some psychological interventions for adherence. We actually talked about these in a lecture a few weeks ago. Uh, we know that patients are more likely to adhere when they have adequate knowledge and understanding of what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. Self-management skills, the ability to problem solve, to plan, to troubleshoot. And the motivation, they're adequately motivated to adhere to this treatment. Um, when that happens, adherence is more likely. So psychological interventions usually focus on those and include um, uh, elements like patient education to make sure the patient understands, teaching behavioral self-management strategies, planning ahead, problem solving, those kinds of issues, developing self-rewards or reminders, leveraging social support, so using other people to, to be reminders or coaches to help keep up with the medication, and sometimes use some kind of follow-up uh, using either telephone, uh, cell phones, text messaging, those sorts of issues. And I put technology on the end here because this is an exciting area of development where we're seeing fast growth and innovation for using uh, various kinds of technology, cell phones, iPads, um, even uh, Bluetooth pill bottles uh, to help people um, adhere to their medications. So that reviews some of the issues related to patient and provider interactions as well as treatment adherence.